Okay, hello everybody, and uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, deliver this lecture. I say it's a, a great honor to be asked to speak about a, a Kerry writer in the Kerry writer, Writers Museum, particularly as I uh, come from the north of Ireland, so it's quite a, a different part of the country. Um, I should also say before I start, say this is actually the first Zoom lecture I've given, so I hope you forgive me if uh, my delivery isn't quite as smooth as it might normally be. But anyway, so to begin, uh, say for those unfamiliar with the work of Morris Walsh, uh, probably the best point of entry is John Ford's classic film, The Quiet Man. Uh, this film, which came out in 1954, I'll just... Uh, the, uh, the, the poster for it. It came out in 1952, and... Uh, it's a, has a, since then has been an iconic Irish film starring John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. It helped shape perceptions of Ireland ever since it was released with its story of a return jank, Sean Thornton, uh, falling out with Squire Danaher, Danaher over his marriage to the Squire's sister, Mary Kitt. The Quiet Man is in fact an episode in Morris Walsh's book, Green Rushes, which consists of five interlocking stories with overlapping characters and uh, incidents reoccurring. They were written to be able to read as standalone stories, but taken together, they constitute an epic novel of the Irish War of Independence. The novel Green Rushes, this episodic novel, came out in 1935 and was an immediate success. When Ford came to make the film of The Quiet Man two decades later, although he had Walsh's cooperation, he changed key elements of the story. Not least, the original lead character, Paddy Bon Enright, was transformed into Sean Thornton. Enright is a returned American and a boxer like Sean Thornton, but he is also a former member of an IRA flying column and seeking a quiet life after the War of Independence. Red Will Danaher, his nemesis, is described as a rancher in the, in, in the original story, a class of farmer that was controversial in 1930s Ireland. So although essentially a romance, Walsh's original story, like Green Rushes as a whole, engages with wider issues of principles, politics, and the condition of Ireland. For the film, Ford expunged all politics and controversy, reducing the plot to its basics, although adding a few twists and new characters with the Irish scenery playing a key role. Thornton is a clean-cut returned American whose personal history is not connected with the Irish Revolution, and Danner is portrayed more as a parvenu and a bully rather than as a land grabber, while the IRA simply provide a comic turn. So although he did capture the essence of this of the original tale, Ford, I think, may have done a disservice to Morris Walsh as a writer. For as I hope to explain, Walsh's novels have more depth and width than this film would lead the unknown viewer to believe. Like many people, I assume, The Quiet Man was my introduction uh, to Walsh. And once I discovered that he had written the original story, I set about reading as many of his books as I could find. And just quickly, uh, this is my, my own personal collection of Horace Walsh books, which can gather various hand antiquarian bookshops over, over the years. And Morris Walsh was born on the 21st of April, 1879, in the Thailand of Bally Donahue, near Listowel, County Kerry. He was the third of 10 children and the first son born to John Walsh and Elizabeth Buckley. They lived in a three room thatched farmhouse, but it would seem that Morris's father was not cut out to be a farmer. He had been educated as far as college level, but his educational career was curtailed because his parents had concerns over his health. That is probably why John Walsh preferred to employ a series of farm hands to work the farm. Uh, the most notable of these hands was a man called Paddy Bon Enright, whose name was later used in the story of The Quiet Man. John Walsh was involved with the National Land League, but he was, in general he was not a rebel and not political. It would appear that his main interests were horses and a love of books, which he passed on to his son Morris, along with an interest in Irish legends and folklore. Morris Walsh went to school in the nearby Lisselton and then St Michael's College of Stowell, where he studied for the civil service examination. He entered the Customs and Excise Service in 1901 as an assistant revenue officer, and after a brief assignment in Limerick, he was transferred to Scotland. Now, Walsh spent much of the next 20 years in Scotland, where his job involved monitoring distilleries in the main whisky producing areas, as well as some other duties to do with taxes and pensions. When he was there, he met Scots novelist Neil Gunn, who also worked for the excise service, and they became very close friends and literary advisors to each other. In fact, his Scottish experience would have a strong influence on Morris Walsh as a writer. 
In 1908, uh, he married Caroline Begg, usually known called by her nickname of Tushin, who came from Duff, Dufftown, Bampshire in Scotland. They had three sons, Ian, Neil and Morris, and two daughters, Molly and Elizabeth, both of whom sadly died young. In 1922, Walsh transferred to the excise service of the newly formed Irish Free State and moved to Dublin, where he joined Cultus Canna, the Irish Customs Officers Association, and wrote for its journal the automatically named Irish Lauer. Transferring to Ireland was a conscious move on Morris Walsh's part, both as an Irish man and as a writer. He was a fervent believer in the Irish nation and in its right to be independent. However, because of the Irish Civil War, his family which he deeply regretted, his family wasn't able to join him until 1923 when peace broke out. Sadly, his wife Caroline died in January 1941. Walsh himself died on the 18th of February 1964 in Black Rock, Dublin, and was buried in Esker Cemetery at Lugan, County Dublin. As an indication of his status, the President of Ireland, Eamon de Valera, attended his funeral mass. It was in 1908 that, that Walsh began his career as a writer. While still in Scotland, he sold two stories to the magazine Irish Emerald. In the mid-1930s, he retired from civil service in 1933. He was one of Ireland's best-selling authors and even had J.M. Barry, creator Peter Pan, and Ernest Hemingway as fans. He wrote 20 novels in all, including historic adventures and contemporary tales, as well as a large number of short stories. His novels were international bestsellers and were translated into Italian, Danish, French, German, French, and German and Flemish. Many of his works were set in Scotland or the west of Ireland, reflecting a rural ideal that was fast disappearing. In his work, he proposed a definition of Irishness that was shaped by shared experience and geography rather than simply race or religion. Reflecting his time in the Highlands, his writing often emphasised the historic and cultural links between Ireland and Scotland. I'm just, uh, So this is uh, Morris Walsh himself here, as you can see in his heyday as a writer, and he's looking very uh, in intellectual. <clears throat> I have to say that I am a fan of Morris Walsh, and I've written about him a number of times for books on the magazine. I think Walsh is an outstanding prose writer. Landscape and geography are a key part of Walsh's writing, and although given fictional place names, his landscape is very real and recognisable. Because of this, he could be compared to John Buchan in the evocation of landscape and rural life. Unlike Buchan, however, Walsh's novels have thoughtful, slow-moving plots. His characters are complex and often consumed with moral doubts. For example, his interlinking stories, Green Rushes, portrays the Irish War of Independence in a nuanced way. The IRA are not all untarnished heroes, and there's a certain sympathy for the British soldiers forced to fight a dirty war. Well, <clears throat> while his writing uh, may be seen as full of adventure and romance, in many ways, Walsh himself was a practical man. He saw the potential of films in making him a commercial success, and from an early period, he, tried, he attempted to woo Hollywood. For example, John Ford acquired the film rights to The Quiet Man shortly after it was first published in <clears throat> the Saturday Evening Post, even though it was to be almost 20 years before the film was made. Among his early stories was Ed Edmund Blake, Blake or the Sack of Athen Ree, which he later used as a basis for his 1932 novel, Black Cock's Feather, which he translated into Irish as Kitcha Kikili for use in schools. However, attempts to get this rising tale of the Nine Years' War turned into a film were unsuccessful. <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> Sorry. <coughs> uh, John Ford's film of The Quiet Man seemed to prove that Walsh's work could transfer successfully to the big screen. One of his other novels, Trouble in the Glen, was made into a film in 1954, hoping to cash in on the success of The Quiet Man. This British effort, although set in Scotland, also features a returned American in conflict with local bigwig, a love affair that does not run smoothly, and even a fistfight uh, with a villain. However, it is far from being the classic that is The Quiet Man. Herbert Wilcox was a workmanlike director with no genius, and the leading man, Forrest Tucker, while an amiable actor lacked the on-screen charisma of John Wayne. Margaret Lockwood puts in a good appearance as the love interest, but the film is most notable for the appearance of Orson Welles, a true cinematic genius, as a South American laird whose closing of an ancient road starts the trouble in the first place. 
For while it's 1954, it was not a good year, he was broke from financing his film of Shakespeare's Othello and took any job that came his way. Some reviewers thought his portrayal of the gaucho lord was the best thing about Trouble in the Glen, even though Wells' dignity battled with a bouffant hairdo and over-the-top Highland costume. I think it was just worth having a look at uh, So here we are. This is uh, Orson Welles playing uh, Senor Mingus, the South American who comes to uh, Scottish Glen to sum us up as a lure. And you see what I mean there about the uh, the Buffon hairdo <coughs> and the, uh, the over the top Highland costume. Uh, Watch himself didn't like the film when it came out and was annoyed very much at the financial aspect of the production, which left him, which did not bring him in the money he had hoped for. He was so disillusioned with the whole experience that he gave up in, fil gave up in films altogether. So although most of Morris Walsh's writing is set in Ireland and Scotland, uh, he, he was not narrow in his outlook. His work, was, his work with the Irish branch of Penn, of which he was present for a time, saw him travel throughout Europe and North America. These experiences had some influence on his writing, where American characters and references are to be found. While not politically active, he was political in the sense that he supported Irish independence and sought to foster links between Ireland and Scotland. Although he hated what he invariably referred to as the bloody British Empire, he bore no ill will towards the British people themselves. During World War II, as Ireland's best-selling author, he was at the forefront of defending Irish neutrality, even though he was proud of his two sons who served as doctors in the British Army. And in the light of recent debates <coughs> following the invasion of Ukraine about Ireland's neutrality in the modern world, I think Morris Walsh's essay on the subject is worth reading, which was published in, the, again, the American new magazine, the Saturday Evening Post. But how do we assess Morris Walsh as a writer from a 21st century perspective? There are three main aspects to Walsh as Walsh's a writer, historical novels, contemporary novels, and short stories. It must be said, too, that Walsh was also a poet and a playwright, and even wrote two detective stories, The Man in Brown and Under the Moon. <clears throat> Walsh's historical novels were Black Cock's Feather, set during the Nine Years' War, and No Quarter, which follows Montrose's royalist campaigns in 17th century Scotland, and Sons of the Swordmaker, inspired by an ancient Irish tale. In many ways, <clears throat> these are conventional adventure stories set in the historical period, and not dissimilar from, some, from such novels by Walter Scott, Robert Louis Stevenson, or Arthur Conan Doyle. Their distinctive feature is that they are set in Ireland during periods of warfare and present Walter's concept of Irish history as a struggle of Irishmen of different kinds fighting English rule. And in the case of Andrew Quarter, uh, showing the affinity of the Scots with the Irish in that same struggle. As with, as with Walter's other work, they display his instinctive prose style and faceted portrayal of the lead characters. They were immensely popular in their day, even if they have fallen out of fashion now. His episodic novel, Green Rushes, might be consigned to the historical list also, insofar as it is the story of the Irish War of Independence. A strong supporter of an independent Irish state, Walsh was determined to give the struggle an, a, a literary work worthy of, its, worthy of it. However, as I said above, it portrays the War of Independence in a nuanced way, in which the IRA are not always heroic, and there is a certain sympathy for the British soldiers, although not, it must be said, for the Black and Tans. To that extent, the novel has more in common with Walsh's contemporary stories. The novels which Walsh set in his own time, the mid-20th century, I think reveal his best qualities as an author. They are often characterised as adventure stories, but he did not write adventure stories as such. His heroes do have adventures, but they're not the kind that involve car chases or gunfights. In these contemporary novels, Walter's heroes face moral dilemmas rather than international conspiracies. Often his books are, ex expir are explorations of what it means to be a man rather than how to be a hero. They're usually love stories, romances for men, if you like, that women could read too. In the tradition of romantic novels, the path to true love is strewn with difficulties. Sometimes it is a mutual dislike at first meeting, at others it is some issue that means the hero cannot follow his heart. They Walsh's contemporary novels tend to be a mix of romance and adventure, although the romance is often awkward and the adventures can be low key. The challenges facing the hero can be something like traversing a mountain on a stormy night. 
rather than just shoot up with enemy agents. Although there's often a terrific fistfight between the hero and the villain, the main danger facing Walter's heroes is usually moral. As in Trouble in the Glen, the lead man has to choose to do the right thing, although he risks losing the woman he loves. And sometimes the right thing is as simple as to find a bullying lord by climbing over a locked gate. This may make Walter's novel sound simple and mundane, but in dealing with moral issues, in effect what it takes to be a man beyond bravery and swagger, he engages the reader and opens a vista of how, li how terrible life can be for those who lose their self-respect. In the original novel of Trouble in the Glen, the hero is a Scot, Gawain Middlethwaite, a baronet recently involved in the RAF after World War II. He's visiting friends at a silver place in Scotland, and the trouble there has already started between the locals and the new laird, Senior Menges, originally from the Scottish Mingus, come from South America to his ancestral homeland. The outward tone of this novel is whimsical and even humorous. Gawain is devoted to his friend Keegan's daughter, Alcyon, and the language between them is that of the old survived tales with Gawain as the knight current. Alcyon is confined to bed with polio, and the closing of the road has cut her off from human contact. In the role of queen, she tasks Gawain with reopening this, this ancient right of way. He accepts the challenge, and climbing over the gate blocking the road meets an ogre in the form of Dukes, the estate factor, and even a princess in Isabel Mingus, daughter of the Laird. There are a number of humorous encounters between Gawain and Isabel as the two fall in love. There are travellers too who are in, integral to the plot and play a part in its resolution. Torn between devotion to young Alcuin, a sense of duty to the townsfolk and a growing love for Isabel, Gawain charts a course that brings things to a satisfactory conclusion, including the fight with the tyrannical jukes. However, this story has a serious subtext. Walsh portrays Britain just after World War II as a gloomy place where the essentials of life are still rationed. He evokes too the ancient tragic history of Scotland. The travelling clan are called the McPhees, they're descend descendants of a broken clan. But most significantly, he shows how war damages men. Although never stated openly, it is clear that Gawain and his two friends, Carnac and Keegan, are suffering mentally from their wartime experiences, what today would be recognised as post-traumatic stress. Gawain's inner struggle is to get his nerve back so as to have the courage not just to do the right thing by Alcuin, but also to commit himself emotionally to Isabel. And the Lord too is a three-dimensional character whose own emotional turmoil contributes to the trouble of the title. Walter's 1934 novel, The Road to Nowhere, I just get this again. is a good example of his approach to literature. The main protagonist, Rogan Stewart, at first dislikes the woman, <coughs> Elizabeth Trant, but then falls in love with her. This is complicated by the fact, firstly, that she is married, and then that Rogan is suspected of murdering her husband. <coughs> Walter's solution to this dilemma is to send Rogan off on a year-long trek through the west of Ireland with a band of travelling people. The main purpose is for Rogan to reevaluate his life and to overcome an earlier tragedy. Fate, of course, brings his path again across that of Elspeth's and the true identity of the murderer. In all this, apart from one massive fistfight between Rogan and the novel's villain, Edmund Butler, uh, there's little in the way of excitement or adventure. Uh, there are poetic descriptions of the Irish countryside, bucolic picture descriptions of life on the road, and serious discussions between the characters about ethics and morals seasoned with much whimsy. I imagine that such a synopsis pitched to an agent today would scarcely be given any consideration. From today's perspective also, Walsh's women are more modern than one may expect. They are of course beautiful and often rich, but they are also intelligent, strong-willed and faced with their own moral dilemmas. Elspeth Trant from The Road to Nowhere, for example, wrestles with what is the honourable thing to do when married to the wrong man, and subsequently, what is the right course of action when you suspect that a good man has murdered your unworthy husband? Despite this, there is a certain tendency to idealise the women, and there is usually some fault, such as haughtiness or vanity, that the hero must cure her of before she be truly happy. So I think, though, why, while Morris Walsh was uh, in some ways quite modern his approach to women. In other ways, he's very much a man of his time and 
fit in very much in with the conventions of the time that you know women had to be beautiful and hoary and that uh, they had to be tamed in some way by a man as I think is probably exemplified most clearly in the film version of The Quiet Man when Sean Thornton has to tame the fairy Murray Kitt. And indeed, talking about The Quiet Man, uh, this film has really dominated uh, any kind of reputation now that Morris Walsh has, and he's really known in the public mind through this film, if people remember him as the writer at all. And uh, it has attracted much attention over the years. For example, there's McHale's uh, book, The Complete Guide to The Quiet Man, Here's the actual film of the, of the, of, the, of, uh, of the, the film itself. See, in the background here, we have a, a guy holding up a shade to control the light, and up here we have the uh, the fellow with the mic. This is the, this is the bit where uh, Sean Thornton and Murray Kate uh, get away from Michael O'Flynn, the uh, the matchmaker. Um, now, some argue that in fact there's a feminist subplot to this story, not least uh, Des Hill himself. I see some raised eyebrows there when I mention a feminist subplot in a, a novel from the 1930s. However, the dispute between Thornton and Danaher is over Murray Kate's diary, but it's hinged on the American's misunderstanding of actually what, what the Irish diary was. He thinks the money is a, like a bribe or a sweetener to him to, for marrying the woman, but in fact, the traditional Irish practice was for the diary to go to the wife. In the scene where the diary first makes its appearance, it is an old gold sovereigns, and it is made clear that these have been passed down from mother to daughter over generations. The idea of the Irish dowry was to give the wife independence. This was her money, not her husband's, meaning that if the marriage did not work out as she would, if the marriage did not work out, she would not be left destitute if she walked away from it. In pre-famine Ireland, before the Catholic Church got a device-like grip on Irish morality, in some parts of the country, so it is said, a wife could declare a marriage over with, within a certain time period and so leave her husband, which is where the dowry came in. In fact, it said that um, it was St. Bridget's Day, if, the, if a couple had been married in the year before St. Bridget's Day, on St. Bridget's Day, if the wife wasn't happy, she, did, she could declare the marriage over and it would be null and void. It's back in 18th century Ireland, but memories of this and folk memories of this carried on well into the 19th and as Morris Walsh shows well into the, the 20th century. To return to the, to the, the story again of The Quiet Man, Murray Kate is furious because Sean is depriving her of her independence, not because he had backed down in the face of her brother's bullying. Relations between the two deteriorate because he fails to understand this. Some say the final denouement as Murray Kate's clever way of resolving the situation so she gets her money, Sean does not lose face, and Dan Hur gets his comeuppance. The scenario of her attempting to flee and Thornton dragging her back to Danaher has been arranged to this end. Unfortunately, feminism is betrayed by Murray Kate when Danaher hands over the money, hands over the dowry and paper money. By now, the original gold sovereigns have been forgotten. Thornton burns the money in the furnace of the steam engine with Murray Kate's approval. In doing so, she is sacrificing her independence in the hope of having a happy ever after with Sean. Now, the original story does not follow this exact trajectory, but it is pretty much the same. And also, do not let us forget that the original cause of the enmity between Paddy Bond Enright, or Sean Thornton in the film version, and Red Will Danaher is a dispute over land. In the short story, Danaher has immorally acquired the Enright family farm, while Paddy Bond Enright has been off fighting for Irish independence. In the film version, Sean Thornton gets hold of a farm that Red Will wants for himself. So the question of land is one that has been central to Irish rural life for centuries. And it has inspired a number of literary works, most notably John P. King's The Field. This 1965 play by another Cary writer has much in common with The Quiet Man. It too features an, an outsider in the form of a man returned from England or America, an American in the film version, a bullying local farmer and a dispute over who has rights to land. And just as Red Will Danner has a Torian sidekick in Feeney, so too does the Bull McCabe have a similar counterpart in The Bird O'Donnell.
Whatever uh, one may think about the themes and messages in Walsh's work, he was, I believe, as I said above, a great writer of prose. Listen, for example, to this act extract from The Small Dark Man. The postmaster came to his side and looked at Kern Barn with him. The great bulk of the mountain tarred close above them, and the summer sun poured all its light on the swelling basalt ribs of it. Three thousand feet above, the pinhead kern stood out against the abyss of the sky that no shred of mist clouded. The foot of the first rise was a burr hundred yards away, and was a temptation to the foot and eye. I think you'll agree that's a very evocative paragraph of just looking up at a mountain that you're tempted to climb. Or right, again, this description from The Quiet Man, that is the story, not the film. As they went through the arch, the purr and zoom grew louder, and turning the corner, they walked into the midst of the activity. A long double row of cone-pointed corn stacks stretched across the haggard, and between, Matt Tobin's portable threshing machine was working full steam. The smooth flying, eight-foot driving wheel made a slippery purr as the black driving belt ran with a sag and a sway to the red-painted thresher. Up there on the platform, burr-armed men were feeding the drum with unbound corn sheaves, their hands moving in a rhythmic swing. And as a toothed drum bit at the ears, it made a gulping snarl that changed and slowed to a satisfied zoom. The wide conveying belt was carrying the straw up a steep incline to where many men were building a long rick. Other men were perched, forking on the truncated cones of the stacks. Still more were attending to the corn shoots and shoulder bending under the weight of full sacks as they ambled across to the granary. So I don't know about you, but to me that is poetry and prose really. I think it's a beautiful piece of writing and very typical of Morris Walsh. I could have picked almost anything, any paragraph from any of his books to illustrate just how good a writer he, he was. However, having said all that, at the same time, I think that Walsh maybe has a tendency towards formality of expression that jars in the modern ear. And so even a fan like myself finds it hard to swallow sentences like, after all, she was only a girl, a girl dowered dangerously in a half strange land, not very wise, not all sophisticated, and the great urge to own her own soul. And those are just the opening clauses of this, this sentence that goes on for quite a bit. And I have to admit also that I believe that even in the 1930s, people, I find it hard to believe that even in the 1930s, people really did address each other as my dark lady, my darling man, or woman of the house. And isn't it, remember, some of these stories stretch into the 1950s. Um, I think this extends also to the names that Walsh chooses for some of his characters. I assume he was aiming for something uh, romantic and grand, but names such as Elspeth, Alson, Edmund, and Rogan don't just sound authentic to the modern ear. And ultimately, ultimately, I think the style makes Walsh's writing sound affected and stilted to modern readers, rendering his novels inaccessible to many. And the reality, of course, is that I could list a number of writers, from Hall Kane to Gertrude Page, and even Walsh's close friend, Neil Gunn, who were international bestsellers in their day, a century or more ago, but are virtually unknown today. It might be easy to dismiss Morris Walsh as being among their number. But having said that, I think Walsh is worth championing as a writer. Perhaps his prose may be difficult for some modern readers, but the effort will be well rewarded. They will find in Walsh engaging plots, sympathetic characters, and a vivid evocation of an Ireland and also of a Scotland that no longer exists. I mean, Walsh was very much a writer of rural Ireland and, and rural west of Scotland in his, his, his contemporary novels, and, as they set in the 1930s and 1940s. And it's, a, it's an Ireland and a, a rural a Scotland that, that no longer exists. But above all of this, I find that uh, they will find that Morris Walsh engages with issues that are just as relevant today as they were in his day. For example, uh, Walsh's idea of what it is to be Irish is very much in keeping with Ireland of today. It's not, an, not an, an idea of Irishness that is based on race or religion, but on common experience and uh, a community. But more than this, I think, Walsh is one of the main themes that we may find in Walsh is what we may call toxic masculinity. Walsh's male characters must find out how to be strong without being cruel, how to be tough while also being kind. And his heroes are not tall and blonde, but often small and dark. 
We are not cocksure adventurers, but men with doubts and a troubled past. The real macho men in Walter's novels, whether Redwell Danaher, the superior Vivian Stark, or Jokes the Gamekeeper, are also the villains. But above all, above all, I think like all good writing, I think that Walter's novels, despite certain drawbacks, stand the test of time. And bearing this in mind, I think we do need to reappraise Morris Walsh as a writer and to recognize him for the great writer that he is.